It is my great honor to introduce our seminar speaker, our last one for the semester, Teresa Forcares y Vida, joining us today from Catalonia. I have to confess that it has been somewhat difficult to know how to introduce her because even the salutations before her name are numerous. She is Sister Teresa because she is a Benedictine nun in the Mountain Monastery of Saint Benet de Montserrat. And she is Dr. Forcares y Vida not once nor twice, but thrice. She is a physician, but she has also completed two other doctoral degrees. The first is a doctorate in sacred theology from the Theological Faculty of Catalonia and the second is a doctorate in public health from the University of Barcelona, which is also where she studied medicine. She has taught at universities in different contexts across Europe, including a new monastic school at her monastery. Yet she has not spent all of her time on the continent. She in fact completed her internal medicine residency in New York and has also completed an MDiv at Harvard Divinity School. Finally, her passion and expertise extend far beyond the monastery, the hospital, or the ivory tower. She has been actively involved in the Catalan independence movement from Spain, as well as many other spheres of social activism. These include uh, issues within medicine and public health, as well as many issues within the Catholic Church. I will conclude then by welcoming our guest, whom the BBC has named the most radical nun in Europe, Teresa Procade Sibila. Hello, uh, all of you, and thank you, Brendan, for this introduction. Um, as you all are aware, I'm here today to talk about health and salvation according to the Gospels. And I will start with a quote from the Gospels, from the Gospel of John. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Indeed, this is the promise the promise of God that Jesus makes possible for each human being, the happy fulfillment, the healing of the wounds, the end of the fight of the flesh against the spirit, inner peace, expansion of the heart. However, after uttering his promise of fulfilled life, Jesus adds the dialectical moment. In order to give us life, Jesus has to lose it. I read John 10.10, 10, now I read John 10.11, the exact following verse, which says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. How should we interpret the unity that those two versicles built to give the life as opposed to share one's life, to give it normally, it means to lose it, to die. Why should the good shepherd give his life so that the sheep obtain life and can live that life in a fulfilled way? Farther down in the Gospel of John, it uh, comes back to this idea when John 15, 13 says, nobody has a greater love than this one. That is to give the life for one's friends. It seems that here it is being stated that the life of some is possible only thanks to the loss of life of others. That the life of some, especially the life, the fulfilled life, we could say the healthy life or the saved life of some only possible because of the loss of life of others. It seems the gospel is saying that. The study of these Johann, jo Johannine verses, Johannic verses in the original Greek language can offer us a first hint to solve this contradiction between losing the life, gaining the life. Because in Greek, we don't read to lose the life or to give the life, losing the life. It's not the same word, life and life. We say like this in English and other modern languages, but the original Greek doesn't say 
to lose the life in order to gain or obtain or attain the life. But it says to give the or to obtain the tsoe, that's the Greek word, tsoe, losing the psyche. Let me show you uh, here. Okay, no, I won't show because of the sharing thing, but you know these words in Greek, soe and psyche, two different words. Psyche is the one being used in John 10, 11, and also in John 15, 11. This nobody has a greater love than the one who gives his or her life for his friends. This life that is to be given is not tsoe. From tsoe comes the word, for example, zoology, the science of life, but understood at the animal level, the tso. Uh, tsoe. Psyche, of course, is the one that gives rise to the word psychology. So in John 15, 11, nobody has a greater love than the one that gives the life for his friends. This word life is psyche. And when it says that the good shepherd gives the life for his sheep, this gives the life is again psyche. But when it says that I am come, I have come to give life, this life is not psyche, in Greek is tsoe, this other word. Two different words, two different concepts. How can we characterize, describe these two different concepts today? One first possibility would be to try to identify the psyche with what in the psychoanalysis, we know as ego or false self-image or ideal I. In this sense, the life Tsoe would be obtained sacrificing the life Psyche, that is overcoming the false images of oneself, overcoming the lies about oneself. According to this interpretation, Tsoe would amount to authentic life or true life. The truth about myself that might be hidden unconsciously in my interior. While psyche would amount to non-authentic life, artificial, false life. That would be the image that I give of myself, my facade, external facade in front of the others, and above all, in front of myself, my false consciousness. The first problem raised by such an interpretation is the following. How can the good shepherd overcome for me, and indeed for each one of his ships or each one of us, how can the good shepherd overcome in my place, the false image of myself that I have, that each one of us has. Isn't the overcoming of the false image of the self a strictly personal task? How can the knowledge of himself, that's the psyche of the good shepherd, free, illuminate or save me? We have the title of health and salvation. How can this save me? How can my salvation, understood as I am uh, explaining now, as overcoming the false consciousness, how can the good shepherd do that for me? How can the good shepherd save me in that way? But this is not the only difficulty of the interpretations that conceive the psyche as ego to be overcome. Together with the difficulty of linking the knowledge of oneself to the liberation, the direct, the efficient liberation of others, the difficulty to link my knowledge of myself to my direct action to liberate others, together with that, we find the difficulty to speak of an ego to be overcome in the case of Jesus, the good shepherd, God incarnated. According to John 10, 11, that is 
the good shepherd lays down, lays down his life, psyche, in order to give life to the sheep, the good shepherd, according to John 10, 11, has a psyche. If he didn't have it, it could not offer it for the sheep. If we identify the psyche with the ego, we should conclude that Jesus had an ego understood as a false image of himself. A false image that is the result of fear of losing face, for example, or the, the desire to show off in front of others. Such a conclusion, of course, contradicts the central tenet of Christian faith, which according or in relation to the humanity of Jesus, and that is that Jesus is in all, or the humanity of Jesus is in all, exactly like ours, except sin. So this fear and this need to show off, this would all belong to this realm of the incurvatum se ipsum of the being that's being trapped in sin and not uh, able to express fully the spirit or the life of the spirit in him or herself. So that's impossible to affirm or to state about the Jesus. So given that the gospel gives witness that Jesus participated of this psyche, we cannot conceive it, the psyche, as something defi deficitary at the human level, as something negative. So the dynamics that we have here is not to get rid of what's bad, to reach or to attain, to obtain what's good. What's bad here would be the psyche, and to attain the good one would be the zoe. But this, we are seeing it doesn't work. This is not the paradoxical and fruitful dynamic of the Eastern mystery. Also, we are not interested, or it's not um, our interpretation to analyze these two versicles of John, identifying the difference between psyche and psyche with a supposedly hierarchical division between the biopsychological life or the earthly life and the eternal or spiritual life. If we did that, if we did that, we would obtain that the good shepherd gives the biopsychological or the earthly life in order that the sheep obtain the, the eternal life. This interpretation, such interpretation, would overcome the difficulty of attributing to Jesus a psyche conceived as something negative or false, the ego. The psyche conceived as the biopsychological life or earthly life, it's not negative, it's not false. However, to oppose the biopsychological life to the spiritual life amounts to structuring our experience, our human experience, according to a spiritualist dualism that it is incompatible with the biblical anthropology as a whole. Biblical anthropology, we know it is diverse and God, uh, thanks be to God for that, but as a whole, it does not establish such a dualism. If we want to stay away from dualism, instead of interpreting the psyche as false identity, ego, or as biopsychological life opposed to the spiritual life, the gospel inspires us and invites us to interpret the psyche simply as the life for which I am responsible the life for which I am responsible, the life that it depends on me. My life then, to the extent that it depends on me, which my life, there might be so many things in my life that do not depend on me. That's true, but there is something in me, in my life, in everybody's life that indeed depends on oneself. 
I'm suggesting to you that the biblical and gospel psyche is at best interpreted as precisely that particular experience of life. My life then, to the extent that it depends on me, that it depends on my irreducible freedom. Psyche would then be my person, my whole person, my unity, bio, psycho, spiritual, non-divisible unity as a whole, but conceived as my process of subjectivation, conceived as the in an alienation, so inalienable, well, I don't know the adjective in, in English, but this space that cannot be alienated, that is my responsibility, that I cannot pass it on to somebody else. This responsibility, which is personal and irreducible, my responsibility in the world. This is the life understood precisely as such, this psyche would be the life that defined us as subjects. And you can come for here, Luke 9.25. And Jesus, is. this is the life that Jesus assumes in his incarnation. The good shepherd shows us, teaches us that only in love we can possess our own freedom that only in the giving up of oneself, we subjectivize ourselves in a full way. And we start to experience already upon this earth, the fulfillment that pertains to this eternal life that we can understand it so, but not in a dualistic way. It's not, the, the point is not to, uh, experience our individual freedom in love as if our freedom were a reality that exists in us in a way that it would be previous to the loving action. It's not, okay, I assume my freedom, my personal freedom, and now I'm going to put that in action by a loving act. That's not what I'm suggesting, that such a pre-existing freedom make sense in us, according to this gospel anthropology, but that we actually receive this freedom in the very act of love, that we receive our being oneself, intransferable being oneself, we receive it as a gift at the very moment of the donation of ourselves that the act of giving oneself, giving one's life understood as that aspect of my life that I am responsible for, this act of opening up or donating it, giving it, is the act that brings about our freedom as something that we received when we engage in such a dynamic that would be the same dynamic that operates in the Trinitarian uh, life or that sustains that life. The psyche, our being well ourselves, we possess it, giving it and opening to this gift of oneself that the others offer to us. That of course here we can use the Greek word koinonia or perichoresis. These are the words, technical words for the Trinity, but they also are the words that animate and sustain and help us visualize and understand what kind of dynamic is God inviting us to have with each other. This dialogue of total love, this communion that brings us into communion with the Trinitarian God, that would be the Tsoe, the eternal life. But I insist, this is not, when I say eternal life, such conceived, so conceived, I don't imply what is going to happen later, right? Eternal life, after death. No, I'm implying uh, a way of living our earthly life already. The psyche, 
the, then defined as I am doing as for short individual life, the psyche would be the individual life. And that would be the personal moment of the Zoe, which is the shared life. That's why it's the eternal life, understanding the eternal life as the life that does not need anymore to defend itself, to uh, protect itself from the others, but that is able to engage in an open uh, gift of self as uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as the Trinity would be engaging in, in these perichoresis. I say it again then, the psyche, individual life, is the personal moment of the Zoe, shared life. The one, the psyche, the individual life, cannot exist without the other, the Zoe, the shared life. It's logic that shared life cannot exist without individual life, because otherwise, what are you going to share? But then I put it in the Greek terms so that we can see how this uh, relates to the gospel that's inspiring us today. Um, opposing to uh, the overcoming the false ego or different than overcoming the false ego, giving oneself or yes, giving oneself, this is something that uh, is dialogical. It's dialogical and it's free in the sense that it's not motivated by the desire to be better, to know myself better or to overcome my problems. But it is only motivated, this giving oneself, the gift of self, it's only motivated by loss. Like Rose offers its beauty. It is dial dialogical because it's a gift, right? And it's directed to somebody. Somebody whom I necessarily consider a partner in dialogue an equal, somebody that is also able to love. This is how God loves us. That's a huge surprise of the Gospels, that God invites us not to be subordinate, not to be uh, servants, but as also the Gospel of John would say, right? I didn't call you servants, I call you friends. That is how God loves us, and God considers us able to love in that way, that the quote here would be Luke 6, 36. For Christianity, equal or the same way for Judaism, what opposes the spirit and makes difficult or obstructs what opposes the spirit and obstructs the expression of the spirit for Christianity and Judaism, what opposes the spirit and obstructs its full expression, it's never matter. That would be for maybe platonic, neoplatonic, pseudo-platonic um, spiritualities that conceive matter as the prison of the spirit, not for the Christian or the Jewish interpretation. Matter is never what obstructs or opposes the spirit, but fear, that's something else. Fear, untrust, lack of trust, exercising violence, lack of love. These are the true forces opposing and op op opposing the spirit and obstructing the expression of the spirit. Fear, untrust, lack of, of trust, exercising violence, lack of love. Everything, all that we name or consider the material world, far from being a prison for us, is the condition of possibility that allows us to experience Precisely that for which we have been created, which is the love of God or the love towards God and the love of the ones for the others. 
In this task of learning to love, I'm a Benedictine nun, Brendan has already said at the beginning, uh, and so I live according to the rule of Benedict. And the rule of Benedict, it says that monastery is a school of love. Uh, so it says what the monks are supposed, monks and nuns are supposed to be doing in monastery is to learn how to love. And it must be not so easy to learn because we need a whole life to do that. So learning how to love, in learning how to love, the living together with others is the main uh, difficulty as subjectively ex experienced, but of course it is uh, the, the, the only way that you can advance towards this goal of learning how to love. But now I don't talk about the necessary um, tensions that arise when you try to share truly your life with others, but specifically of what we call the matter. In this task of learning how to love, matter is not our enemy, but our ally. Because it is only through the limits of space and time that matter imposes on us, only through the limits of space and time that matter, material world, imposes on us, only through them it is possible for us to become conscious of our capacity to choose and to exert our freedom. Now I will quote in my own translation, but I'm quoting now the words of the philosopher Immanuel Kant in the introduction of the critique to pure reason. He says, the light dove, like moving in his free flight, the air, the resistance of which it experiences, could imagine this light dove, dove could imagine that his, her, its flight would be much easier in a vacuum. So Plato, abandoning the sensible world that closes the intelligence in such narrow limits, flew, right, flight flew, flew in the vacuum of the pure understanding or the pure intelligence without noticing that with his efforts, that's Plato's efforts, he was not advancing because he was lacking the point of sustenance where he could apply his forces to be able to move in the sphere of intelligence. That's a critique of Kant, but what interests me is especially the first analogy, right, that Kant offers us. The dove is flying, it's experiencing the resistance of the air, and Kant imagines that the dove thinks, now yeah, that's why I'm just having difficulty on flying, and without the air, I would fly much quicker, right? It's a logical thought, but we know what would happen without the air. Without the air, the dove would be unable to fly. It would just immediately plump down and just crash against the ground. That's the analogy from Kant that I also take to talk about the place of the material world in the Christian and Jewish understanding. The Apostle Paul announces the transformation of our earthly body in a spiritual body. That's 1 Corinthians 15. And the Christian creed proclaims the resurrection of the flesh. It is not only on earth, but also in the plenitude, the fulfillment, in the human fulfillment represented by this idea of heaven. Also there, the Christian soul is, it reveals itself as inseparable of the body. And the person, it's not conceivable without both. So it's only conceivable, the person, with both not conceived as a dualistic 
joining together, but a true unity. In the New Testament, the flesh normally designates the body that it is not dynamized by the spirit. The body abandoned to the inertia of the causal chain. So action, reaction, action, reaction. The body activated, animated by the spirit, on the contrary, is the correlate of the dimension esse in of the person, that is, of his or her freedom. It is the irreducible space that individualizes the person and allows her or him to be truly distinct of all others, truly original, truly distinct of all others, and also distinct from God. And here is the unheard of aspect of the Christian and Jewish tradition, that God does not absorb the human being, does not eliminate his or her individuality, but it becomes the warranty of the space that allows that God can be towards the human being an interlocutor, a partner in dialogue, a partner in dialogue, so that the human being can be, and that's the unheard of, the partner of God in a true dialogue. God sustains the space of otherness that gives consistency to the human freedom. God sustains, is the one sustaining this space of otherness that, as we know, exists also in the Trinity itself. There is an otherness in the Trinity. It's one God, yes, we know, but there is an otherness. There is a distinction. There is what traditionally we call Father, we could talk about patriarchal language, but it's not the topic today. So let me use the classical terms, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Well, the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and neither of them is the, Holy, the, the Son. So the point is, there is a distinction, and yet we predicate of such a distinctive something, we predicate the highest unity of all, the unity of God. So otherness is sustained by this God. And because of this sustaining the space of otherness, we can have a human freedom that is consistent and not just fictitious or illusory. According to the rabbi Isaac Luria, who lived in the 16th century, this is possible. This sustaining the otherness that God uh, does, it is possible because the act of creation is not an act of expansion towards what or towards where could God expand if the notion that there is something that exists beyond God it's inconceivable how can the creation be here is God and now God creates so that something happens somehow outside of God it's not, according to Luria, an act. It cannot be an act of expansion, but it's also not, according to Luria, what maybe the, and there are different versions, I don't want to come into polemics here, but panentheism sometimes um, helps us to see how God can be living in all there is, right? But for Luria, it's not an act of expansion, but it's also not the case, that's why I'm quoting here Luria, because the otherness, I want to affirm the otherness in the most radical way that I think comes from this Jewish Christian tradition. So that it's not possible to place creation outside of God, but also for Luria, you don't place it inside of God to, for example, how pantheism could do it. So what is the solution for Luria is that the creation is not an act of expansion, but it's an act of contraction. And that means, that's the word that maybe some of you, or maybe all of you know, the Jewish word tzimtzum. It's being used by Luria to express precisely that, that before or as the first act of creation, God contracts. And by contracting, now 
there is a space that can be truly authentically inhabited by an otherness in relationship to God. It is God who is creating it, of course, who else? But it is because God has done it, a true space of otherness. And in that space of otherness, it's going to be possible to be safe, to be healthy in relationship to that space. So God contracts. It uh, goes back, so to speak, and it's beautiful because that's what we are called to also be able to do with each other in our relationships, to make a space, but not in a contrived way or forced way or sacrificial way, but in a, a joyful, free way to make a space. So God contracts, God goes back, so to speak, and then space and time appear, which are the coordinates of creation. The divine contraction, it is maintained, sustained in time and makes possible the alterity that constitutes ourselves and that our body expresses. We are not like burning flames separated from the divine fire, that desire to come back to be one in an indifferentiated way with this fire. We are a unity of body, soul and spirit created to the image of God, constantly and cordially invited to establish an intimate and free communion with God. Both the Orthodox and the Catholic Christianism affirm that Mary of Nazareth, the mother of Jesus, was a assumpta, that's the assumption in heaven. So we can read here, it, it reached the plenitude of his, his human plenitude in body and spirit. That equals to affirm, to state that the way that Mary lived his, her personal identity on earth was totally free. Mary was totally herself, with no fear, with no mistrust, without acting violently, with no deficit or lack of love. She assumed her responsibility in the contingency of the world and in the vicissitudes, the, everything that happened in her vital trajectory. That was not precisely easy. Mary was not violent, but her life was affected, fully affected by the violence of the world. She had to witness the torture, the uh, mm, mockery and the public execution of her son. But the exter external violence, uh, extreme as it was, it did not cause in her interior violence. Equal as in the same way does her son Jesus, Mary, instead of hating, it forgave and it loved. Using the expressions of St. Paul, we could affirm that the earthly body of Mary, like the one of Jesus, corresponded without separation to the spiritual body. That would be how I understand this expression of being full of grace. Um, of course, in the case of Jesus, this wouldn't be uh, contested in the whole of Christianity with Mary. So I don't want to enter in polemics, but I wanted to make the point that this, I believe it's what God invites us. This would be the salvation that God is uh, asking us to trust, that we can live fully from uh, this space of love. That's not a space of um, obliterating our individuali individuality, but of owning it fully. But we own it only fully when we open up to the gift of self. To speak of a life like I have just done, right? To speak of a life without fear, without mistrust, without uh, acting violently and without lack of love, it really sounds alien to the human experience, the normal human experience. It is difficult to believe that the human can be so. 
But this is the good news of the gospel. We can live, we can, we can be nonviolent, we can be loving. This is the horizon that gives meaning to the human life. When we live the human life with fear, with mistrust, exerting violence against others, with lack of love, then there is no correspondence between the earthly body and the spiritual body. But the earthly body needs to be transformed before it reaches the fulfillment. In his letter to the Christians of Corinth, the Apostle Paul compares the transformation of the earthly body to that of a seed. We know well the quote that a seed is being planted, an earthly body is being planted, a heavenly body resurrects. The spiritual body of which Paul, uh, to which Paul alludes reflects what we are authentically. And what is decisive is to state that the Christian soul, differently or as opposed to the Platonic soul, the Christian soul cannot achieve or obtain plenitude without the body. This is very peculiar, we are familiar with this, but it's very peculiar, this insistence on the body, this resurrection of the flesh, this the earthly body, yes, it's planted, it will be transformed, okay? We don't imagine the atoms of carbon and uh, to be in this realm of the uh, heavenly or spiritual, but it is not left, uh, it's not left uh, behind. It is transformed. We need the body also, uh, or precisely for this planet to, to experience this salvation. What is incompatible? Uh, with the, uh, I insist on that idea, what's incompatible with the human fulfillment, with salvation, is not the body. It is fear, mistrust, exercising violence, lacking love. It's impossible to find these things in heaven. Lack of love, abuse, violence, uh, mistrust. But is it possible to find body in heaven? Well, yes, that's what this uh, affirmation is of Jesus being uh, such in heaven. The in, in this in inseparable, the inseparable unity, body, soul, spirit, gives an absolute meaning to our personal history. And it does preclude us, it does not allow us to interpret it as a succession, an indefinite succession of second opportunities. According to this view, there is not a second life in space and time that will allow me to learn how to live better, that will allow me to learn how to love better. Because the limits, and here is the point, right? Of course, I'm alluding to the idea of reincarnation. I'm affirming, according to this gospel tradition, there is not such a thing as a second opportunity our life is where we are invited to learn to love, and there is not a second opportunity, uh, a second life, because precisely the limits of having only one, precisely the limits of having only one are not an obstacle, but precisely the condition of possibility to learn what love means. I'm making the comparison with Kant, right? The dove believes and it's very understandable to, to imagine that the dove can believe this, that without air, it would go quicker. And making that a parallel of us believing that with a second, third, fourth life, we could learn what love is all about. But the point is, like the dove, without the air, would just plump down. This limit, apparent, apparent limit of having only one life is not obstructing us in the needed learning of what love means, but it is actually where we can learn it. If we remove this obstacle, if we were to remove it, we cannot do it uh, physically actually, but we can imagine it's not there. Then we lose, not we don't gain, we lose opportunity to learn what love is all about. 
without limits, we would never learn truly what love is. To love, it's a simple gesture that is um, possible to all, and that does not depend on the circumstances, but only on the capacity to trust, even if you cannot give name to that on what you trust. To love is a simple and personal gesture. It is distinct for each person. It is distinct in each circumstance. It is alive. The human capacity of trusting and be becoming responsible, fully responsible for uh, the trust up to the last consequences, it needs to be exerted in this limited life, limited by space and time, which is the only one we have, and that for this very reason acquires an urgency and a dignity that are absolute. My body is not an instrument that I use and that I'm going to abandon as soon as it's not longer serving me. Without the body, simply I cease to exist. To value thus the body implies to disidentify it of the atoms that constitute it and that certainly I will abandon after death and are recycled by nature and maybe, well, not maybe, almost surely, right? What we have now in our body uh, from this uh, strictly physical perspective is atoms that have belonged to other uh, living beings before, right? But the earthly body is constituted by atoms and the atoms are abandoned, but the body subsides without them and then receives the name of spiritual body. The eternal life, we go back to that so a, it is this new life that can already be experienced, start to be experienced during the earthly life, not only in a mystical uh, way, but in a way that's above all practical. When we love each other and we try to um, advance towards the common good, our life is transformed, not in a mystical, esoterical or uh, only a spiritual way, but it is transformed in a visible, physical, palpable way when we love each other and try to work for the common good, especially, especially, and now it's very relevant, this example, especially if we are sick and we depend on the others to survive. I said it's very relevant for the obvious reason of the pandemia and the COVID. In the New Testament, the survival, that is life, seen as materiality and sustenance, it is spoken of, I'm looking at the time because we want to make sure, it is this life as materiality of life, because we have seen psyche and zoe, but there is a third word in the gospel that is being used to say life. And if we look at the translations, you don't see the difference because you see life, life, life. But sometimes it's zoe, Sometimes it's psyche and sometimes it's bios. And this bios, for example, you can find it in Mark 12, 44. That's the poor widow that Jesus praises because she has given the two smallest possible coins, the two smallest coins. But Jesus says it has given more than anybody else because she has given all that she has for her life. But this life is not so, it's not psyche, it is bios. All she needs to live normally in English, this is translated not as life, as living, what she needs for living. But the word in itself, bios, means life. So these three, the bios together with psyche, which we have seen life as subjective freedom, we can call it also soul, and soe which is eternal life or communion with God, with God and with each other. This together, bios, psyche, zoe, they conform the triad, the Christian anthropological triad. The triad, bios, psyche, zoe, superficially, it could seem parallel to the platonic triad, body, mind, spirit. 
But in reality, it's very different and it should not be interpreted according to the idealist postulates. The Platonic triad is dualistic and hierarchical. Body and spirit are opposing each other. The uh, mind or the soul needs to dominate the body. The triad or the anthropology, the biblical triad or the biblical anthropology is Unitarian, not hierarchic. Whoever wants to save his or her life, and here, now I'm quoting Matthew, Matthew, Matthew 16, 25. Whoever wants to save his life, and here is psyche, will lose it. But who loses it for me, it will find it. This statement appears with little variations in the three synoptic gospels. In the gospel of Mark and in the gospel of Matthew, the passage appears just after Jesus has called Peter Satan, because Peter denied that Jesus needs to suffer. And uh, Jesus says, whoever wants to come with me takes, up on, takes on his cross, her cross, and follow me. Jesus uh, rebukes Peter that he doesn't think like God, but like the humans. So what is Jesus doing here? Is now Jesus situating the plans and the thinking of God as contraposed, as in opposition to our human desires of fulfillment and absence of suffering? Is Jesus doing that and thinking, if you are thinking like God, then you don't care about suffering and you just are ready to, to put up with all possible suffering, take your cross and just shape up, harden up, something like this. No, it's a, it's a full no. That's not what Jesus is doing. The affirmation of Irenaeus of Lyon, the bishop of the second century, it stands, the glory of God is that the human being lives, lives. The glory of God is that the human lives in fulfillment, not thing to do with the suffering. Jesus does not contradict this statement of Irenaeus of Lyon, Bishop Irenaeus. Simply, but this is, this is key, Jesus adds realism to that. In his word and his life, Jesus situates, places the desire of God for us, this desire that humanity lives safe, healthy, fulfilled, that all have life and have it in abundance. This is the true desire of God. But in his words and his life, Jesus places such a desire in the historical the concrete historical context of our circumstances. If the life that God offers us and for which God has created us is the happy life that finds its plenitude in the shared love, to try with seriousness to put that into practice in the world as the world is, no doubt it will make us suffer. No doubt it will put us on trial, or it will try our health, or even if we are sufficiently coherent, maybe it will reduce our life expectancy, like it happened to Jesus, right? He didn't die of an old age. What's important is to emphasize that this, that's what's important, it's to emphasize that this apparent division between biological life or body and spiritual life, spirit, does not correspond to a dualism that opposes them in an intrinsic of or necessary way. In the Christian perspectives, the spiritual life and the biological life are not contraposed, cannot be opposed to each other, but can also not be simply identified with no distinction. It's also not possible to fixate the relationship of these two, the biological life and the spiritual life, in a way that they always increase or decrease together. 
That's not the case. It might be the case that the life of the spirit increases. It approaches plenitude while the biological life goes down. And on the contrary, you can have a biological life that approaches its plenitude and a spiritual life or life of the spirit that decreases. For example, if somebody abandons to his own uh, destiny, abandons a brother that is sick with an infection, infectious disease that is highly contagious, if you abandon that other person, that brother or sister that has uh, an infectious disease, probably you will save, you will protect yourself from having the disease, which means you will increase your biological life, but only to the cost of decreasing by your act of lack of love, decreasing not only, and here is the point I want to make, decreasing not only your spiritual life, but also, and this is where Jesus puts the accent, right? The dualism would tell us, of course, you just have to risk your physical life, which means nothing to attain the spiritual life, right? And with the example of the infectious disease, it seems that I am backing up this dualism because it's like, yes, you don't need to care for your biological life. And precisely when you abandon your biological life or you risk your biological life, your survival, you're being sick, your health, then you attain salvation, right? That's the title of the talk, health and salvation. It seems that now towards the end of the talk, I'm making the point, it seems, you'll see that's not the case. I'm making the point that by risking your a biological life, you increase your spiritual life. And so dualism, separation, opposite dynamics, it's true that if you risk your biological life for the sake of a sick, infected brother or sister, you will put, uh, you put it at risk and you will increase your spiritual life by the act of love. That's true. But it is also true that what you do when you abandon the brother is to decrease the biological life of your brother. So that means by increasing your spiritual life, by helping the other who is infected, by helping the other who is infected, you love, you increase your spiritual life and you increase the biological life of your brother. That's where the dualism crashes. And that's the point I wanted to bring this whole talk to. That's where the dualism crashes because you don't look only of yourself. I've said this thing about Zoe, the shared life, about God, the Trinity. The whole thing is, if you only look at yourself and the individual, then there is no way out of the dualism or contradiction or just plain bored thing. If you, on the contrary, without decreasing to the minimum, to the, without decreasing at all your individuality, your subjectivation, the space where you are responsible for yourself, the, this distinction and originality of the psyche, psyche without decreasing that on the contrary by making it stronger even, you enter into a dynamic that if you think of the dynamic of life together with the other, then you will see how the achieving or strengthening of the spiritual life actually strengthens the biological life. Not your own, maybe, but the biological life of the brother. I'm about to finish, Brendan. And so that is the point, right? That in the solidarity, it is in the solidarity of all humanity, only there, but that's the proposal of God, the koinonia, in the solidarity of all humanity, and only there, that it's true, the statement of Irenaeus in a non-dualistic way, the glory of God is that humanity with no exclusions, all of it lives. From a point of view that recognizes, acknowledges the centrality and the indispensable character of the mutual help in the human life, only from there, it 
becomes or it receives its meaning, the notion of the church as the mystical body or the body of Christ. Our corporality and our need to take care of each other are a blessing. But when the uh, aging or the disease provoke that the person needs help, even for the intimate daily hygiene, then the physical limitations can be experienced as degrading. Our culture associates the dignity of the person to her personal autonomy. The Christian tradition, on the contrary, associates the dignity of the person to his or her having been created to the image of God. How the four sisters in my monastery who have lived beyond 100 years of age, I have already been together with four of them, as they have shown me the need of take care of each other that is caused by the fragility of the body has a unique capacity to reveal to us something of the God, communion God that sustains us and constitutes our horizon of salvation, of plenitude. It reveals us that we have been created to the image of God as a bio-psycho-spiritual unit and that we are necessarily and constitutively original and relational beings. It is the body inseparable of the soul and the spirit, the one that sustains our personal originality, our distinctive identity, and it is the body the one that makes possible that we take care of each other and sustain each other. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Sister Teresa. This was an amazing talk. And I have personally come away with so much. This has been a wonderful close to the uh, TMC seminar series this fall. And thank you for this masterclass. And many thoughts, wonderful, wide ranging and provocative thoughts about uh, health and salvation. Thank you all for coming today. Mm -hmm.